tools, sir. They're instruments. I can't get that tune out of my head. Like that? You like that? You like that? I, I, I think tunes jump from head to head. I, 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 here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the CEO of the Churchill Club, Karen Tucker. Thank you very much. Good evening to you. I'm Karen Tucker, CEO of Churchill Club. Welcome. This is a very special occasion for us, all of us this evening, as we welcome Bill McDermott, co-CEO of SAP, in conversation with Jeffrey Moore, legendary author, speaker, and advisor. We wish to thank SAP, our longtime partner and friend, for making this program possible with a special nod to Jonathan Becker, Barbara Holsapfel, Jason Hardy, and Christine Johnson. Thank you so much. <laughs> Next up, we have a remarkable set of programs for you on Thursday, September 13. First, a day-long event called Changing the Game, co-designed by IDEO as part of the curatorial team. You will hear an amazing group of speakers with fresh insights around change and innovation. And you'll also have spectacular opportunities to experience a variety of processes that are designed to surface innovative ideas. So there will be lots of value to share with your teams. And that same evening, you can catch the Churchill Awards, which is a program to inspire others by highlighting excellence in four areas that I think all of us care about deeply, innovation, collaboration, uh, leadership slash mentorship, because we believe that leaders are good mentors and also societal benefit. The honorees were selected by the Churchill Club Academy, which is a group of about 500 people in the innovation community as we think about it. And I'll tell you tonight that the Game Changer Award goes to SpaceX, the Magical Team Award goes to Box, the Legendary Leader Award goes to Vinod Kosla, and the Global Benefactor Award goes to SAP's own Hasso Plotner. And as master of ceremonies that evening, we are going to be very proud to welcome back Jeffrey Moore. Both of these programs fall into the do not miss category and they will be held in Santa Clara. If you're tweeting tonight, please use the hashtags Churchill Club and SAP Bay Area and you will find other Twitter codes in your printed program. There is no one more recognized worldwide for his unique ability to understand and capitalize on disruptive technologies than our moderator, Jeffrey Moore. Jeff has made this the core of his life's work so far. His books are required reading at leading business schools, Crossing the Chasm, Inside the Tornado, The Gorilla Game, Living on the Fault Line, Dealing with Darwin, all bestsellers too, and his latest book was published last September is called Escape Velocity, Free Your Company's Future from the Pull of the Past. Jeff spends a good chunk of his time advising senior executives on strategy and transformational challenges. And when he isn't doing that, he's developing mental models to support his advisory practice or as a venture partner at Moore David Al Ventures, he's advising portfolio companies and we're always delighted to welcome him to our stage. Our guest of honor, Bill McDermott, became co-CEO of SAP along with Jim Hageman Snobby in February of 2010. And since then, he has been a key figure in envisioning and implementing sweeping and exciting changes in this 40-year-old industry-leading company. Bill has been instrumental in re-architecting SAP's strategy beyond traditional applications and analytics to the cloud, mobile, big data, and real-time computing with the HANA in-memory database. And he has helped put the company on a new mission, which is simply stated, to help the world run better. He has been an SAP executive board member since 2008, 
And not only has he been recognized as one of the most influential executives in information technology, but also for his civic leadership. We look forward to hearing about his vision, insights, and leadership tonight. Please welcome Bill McDermott and Jeffrey Moore. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Terrific. Okay. But before I um, start interrogating my friend, Mr. McDermott, <laughs> j j just, I want to just do a couple of things. A couple of people came up to me and said, now I want you to ask him really hard questions. Actually, my goal is going to be to try to ask him important questions, which are sometimes the same thing, but, but not always. And I have a point of view that I want to share with you in a couple of minutes, and then we're going to get into this. So I think we're in the middle of something where our entire environment and our entire culture, both as consumers and as business people, is being revolutionized by this digital mediation. And so the digital world used to be something we could keep separate from the rest of our lives and the rest of our practices, and that's no longer true. We are completely immersed in a, in a, in a kind of a redefinition of the human experience that's digitally mediated and is touching everything. And we're right in the middle of that change as a society and, and as a world. And when you're in the middle of that kind of change, when there's that sort of transformation happening in your, in your environment, you look for anchor points. And inevitably, the, the companies that are established in the industry at the time the change starts are a set of anchor points. And they're incredibly important for the life of the transition, although it's, not, it's clear that some of them won't make it all the way, and others will. And we're in the middle of In our valley right now, we have, a, we have a number of very cherished companies that are sort of, frankly, on the bubble right now. And, and we care a lot about them. We, we, we need them to get, to get to the other side of this thing. We hope they will. But SAP is an interesting example of a very large company that is actually thriving in the, in, at this time, which is, not, which is not normal in times of disruptive change, frankly. It, it, it's, so it's, it makes it a pretty interesting company to talk about. And, and so that's where I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to take it tonight. I'm gonna try to say what's going on. I think we, it's important for this valley to understand the trajectory that SAP is on, what it is trying to be. I think it's, it's important for us to understand what role we might play in that future and probably equally important, or perhaps more important, because we're pretty self-centric, what role that might play in our future as, as well. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be pushing in that direction. I'm going to ask a bunch of questions. Uh, and at some point, uh, I'm going to open this up to, to, the, to the room. So I w if, if there are hard questions which I don't ask, which I suspect there may be, I, I, I'm going to turn that back over to you. And we have a Mark and a Marsha somewhere who are going to have theirs, the, who are going to have microphones a, a, and do that. But I also want to have a little fun with Bill, because Bill and I have known each other for almost a decade. And in fact, I thought we'd start with just a little bit about your personal background. So just, you know, where did you start? Where were you born? Where'd you start? How'd you get here? I was, uh, thank you very much, Jeffrey. Uh, and by the way, thank you all very much for coming. I know you have very important and busy schedules and to dedicate some of this time with us tonight means a lot. Thank you. Um, I come from uh, New York. I was born in New York City, grew up in Long Island, New York. I guess my early claim to fame might have been trading in four part-time jobs for my delicatessen business. I actually... How uh, old were you at the time? I was 16. <laughs> Most and of us at 16 were doing that. Yeah, okay, keep going. But <laughs> what, what was fundamentally interesting about that is, um, you know, I, I traded in these part-time jobs for this delicatessen, and I bought the place for $5,500 in notes, which means you're too broke to afford it, and someone actually trusted you with a loan. And the deal was you pay it off in one year, give them 7000 or they get everything back. And what I learned at Delhi is very much appropriate at SAP. That's the only reason I go into it. And it was really the fundamental lesson of customers. You know, how do you get the kids to walk past 7-Eleven an extra block and a half to come to your store? Well, you study the fact that 7-Eleven only lets them in four at a time. And I reminded the kids that, you know, you haven't even stolen anything yet, and they don't even like let you in the store. <laughs> and, you know, the neighborhood I grew up in, it wasn't guys in ties. It was blue-collar workers. And what we know about blue-collar workers, I know I lived it firsthand. They're rich on Friday night and broke by Saturday morning. So, you know, we gave them credit, and no one else would. And then, of course, there was a senior citizen condominium complex about two blocks down the road. What we learned about senior citizens is they don't like to leave the house, so we deliver. So early on, I thought that it was important to get inside the head of the customer because I had to make payroll. But there was one other special idea or an innovation that came up then, which was 
the idea of video yep. and you know these games. Back then, the kids would be in malls plucking quarters into the games. So I took the number off the back of the machine. I called the guy up and I said, hey, can I get one of these machines? He says, yeah, you can. Give me 5000 I said, I don't have 5000 but I'll tell you what. I'll put a little room off the side of the store. Let's split the quarters. In 60 days, we paid the store off. Yeah? <laughs> All right, OK. No. All right, good deal. OK, so let's move on. So somewhere along the line, I, although, you know, I'm thinking I'm the SAP recruiter, and I'm going, Delhi. Uh, well, there was a few machine. steps after. Oh, okay, 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 okay. So when, so I'm, I'm going to jump forward. So when did you actually join? Did you start with SAP and Tech? Was that your? Where did you start? My first job, um, I sold a deli, bought my parents a beach house, God bless and you. I started with Xerox when I was 21 years old in New York City. And they were the train, the sales training machine of the era, weren't they? They absolutely were. And at the time, there was a CEO named David Kearns, yeah. who was reinventing the company on something called total quality management. And I remember reading the annual report on my way to New York saying, I want to be this guy, you know? Yeah. This guy is somebody. And of course, that's how I beat the Ivy League guys with the suits. Well, of course. Because I just told <laughs> everyone that asked me for the darn sales job knocking on cold doors that I wanted to be the next CEO of Xero. <laughs> so, um, but I was there 17 years okay. and um, wow. uh, spent some time at Gartner and yeah. Siebel and was recruited to SAP in 2002. So yeah. I've been here now more than a decade. And that's when I, you were head of American sales at that time, right? That's correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind of move forward. Now, you guys, you guys, I'm going to go fast forward to 2010. You and Jim um, are, are made co-CEOs. Why co, what, what, so the co-CEO thing is not, a big, is not a big paradigm in this valley. What, what's going on there? In our company, uh, SAP, the original founders were co-CEOs. So it was Hasso and Henning? Hasso no, at that no, time no, no, and Dietmar Hopp. Dietmar, that's right. And that's then right. there was Hasso and Henning. And then there was Henning and, and Leo? And then there was Henning and Leo. And then Leo had it for a short period of time right. on his own. So we kind of went back to the co-CEO model. Yep. And that seems to work in our culture. And, <laughs> and how do you play it? I mean, how does, I mean, how does it work? Well, first of all, I think the fundamental piece of this that makes it work is trust. Yeah. In hmm. 2009, and Jim and I know each other a long time, but in 2009, we fundamentally said, we got to come together. He had the product side of the equation. I had the customer side of the equation. And we got to bring our team together. this was together. a tough year. This was a very tough very year. Very tough year. Yeah, yeah. And you know, people were really down, customers were even down. And I'm like, we got to just come together and figure this out. And out of that came like this burst of hope. And I think that people in the company, including the board, noticed it. And when the move was made and Hasso and the supervisory board unanimously appointed us as co-CEOs, it really came together for us that we were in, in charge of something really important, which was to give the company a vision and give the company a real strategy, something that people could understand and get their arms around. Well, that's it. So, so, so that, that, this is kind of, the, I want to spend a little bit of time here. So it's 2010, you guys are put in this position. You look out, what was, as you looked at SAP and you looked at the situation we're in, kind of what was your hard-nosed situational, like what's really going on here? And, wh and what bets did you start deciding at that point you thought you were going to make? Well, it was a Saturday morning. I was flying uh, to Hawaii to... Because most to candidate do, CEOs would, would of do Of course, that. to go on vacation in Hawaii. No, no, it was, no, it's a customer visit, customer we, visit. We had a recognition trip for our top performers, and I was the host. Yep. And I get the call in a hotel in Phoenix from Hasso that he and the board made a decision to make a change, and he asked me to be the co-CEO of the company. And, of course, I asked, you know, who is my co? <laughs> uh, you know? And, I'm um, getting married. Could you introduce yeah, me to my God, wife? I'd just like to know who I'm walking down the aisle with here, you know? And, um, and he said it was Jim. And I said, well, that's a great decision. And then I called up Jim. And uh, I, I said, you know, how are you doing? And he said, well, you know. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Um, <laughs> and um, I'm, you know, pretty much ready to go. And then I landed in Hawaii. And we right away started working virtually on the communication plan. And I flew from Maui back to the main island. And this is unbelievable. You can't make this stuff up. The first morning, it's like 4.30 in the morning. I'm in, because you know, you're dealing with European and, and uh, Hawaiian time. Behind a dumpster at a hotel on the main island of Hawaii with bees swarming around me. 
Of course, the good news is the company couldn't see that. And I am fired up, ready to go. <laughs> and he's fired up. And it was just like the beginning of a really great marriage. That's and cool. I think That's that cool. uh, it's really fun. You know, we said we're going to make the world run better. So, okay, but since then, yeah. since then, go back to, I want to go, what did you see in 2010 that gave you pause that you thought, man, if we don't turn this stuff around, this, this is not going to be good. Well, in 2009. 2009. Uh, okay, so sorry. Uh, when we took it over in 2010, what I saw is a, a lack of innovation and a, a lack of empathy for the user and the customer experience and a lack of connecting the value chain from the R&D through the sales, services, and customer experience. A company that needed a, a purpose and a mission and really needed to bear down and get the job done. So it was leadership, it was a vision, and it was a strategy. And we spent the first two weeks, literally, day and night, Doing, working on that, out. that around the clock. And a lot of people say, two weeks? Yeah, you don't need two years to do a good strategy. Mm -hmm. What you need is focus. And um, you know, if you want to talk more about that. Well, I'll I do, I'll push you to it. So, so when, when we talk about strategy, two things we think about, one is, what market forces did you think were the, like, if you were a sailor, and I know Hasso is yeah. a sailor, there's a guy in the Bay Area who's also a sailor. Uh, they sometimes sail against each other on occasion. But, but, but you think about where's the wind coming from, right. and then you think about where am I going to sure. make my bet. So let's talk about the wind and then the boat. So, so, so what market forces did you think were going to matter over the next five years that you said, look, we've got to put our company in the way of these sure. things? Well, the first personal feeling I have about strategy is you got to keep the main thing the main thing. And what I see with a lot of companies is they forget their core and they get all distracted with things they're not. And we tried to just focus on keeping the main thing the main and thing. And the main thing at SAP? The main thing at SAP is we were the market leader in business applications and analytics in 24 industries across the world. So you've got to focus and make sure you don't leave that behind, yep. which led us to a strategy we called innovation without disruption. Because okay. we said the customers will want to innovate with us, but they will not want to disrupt what they fundamentally have already spent money on. Yeah, please don't. You, you, right. we're, all, we're all sitting on top of you guys. <laughs> exactly. And, and we, we got that message. Okay. And we could have tried a different tactic by getting them to switch and change to something brand new. And we didn't think that was the right thing for the customer. Right. So the customer was the center of gravity for every decision. Then we saw three main things, okay. three turbo engines in addition to applications and analytics. Number one, mobility. We knew that mobile was the new desktop. We knew that if you have more mobile devices in the world than um, toothbrushes, something must be going on here. You knew that. You know that now. Everybody in the room knows that now. Did you know that in 2009? Yes. yes. Okay. We did our research. Okay. We put a lot of time into research and market dynamics. So we, we saw what was going on. Okay. We saw the eye economy and all that. Um, so we knew that if mobile was the new desktop, things were going to move to the device, including applications. People would need to manage those devices. They'd need to secure those devices. We figured that could be a big business. The second thing we thought of is... But you had no position in that business. None. SAP had no assets. None. Okay, all right, got it. Keep I going. Mean, okay. uh, look, That's good. I could tell you we had some, but they were so small it wouldn't have mattered. Right, okay, fair enough. The second thing is um, we knew cloud was going to be big, and it was going to be big not just in virtualizing ho hardware and private clouds and making companies far more efficient. Companies don't want hardware. You know anyone who wants to buy any hardware? Mm. Me neither. So actually, be, be, be a little gentle. There, there's some hardware companies in the, in the Bay Area. They want to buy solutions. <laughs> they want to buy solutions that might have hardware attached to it. Okay. But they do not want to buy commodities and boxes. Mm -hmm. So it's got to be a solution bundled with a service and a good payback, and then you can get their attention. So we believe that was going to happen. How would that affect you, though? Why, why do you care? Well, the, the cloud as a force we cared a lot, a lot about because, as you know, we were in business by design at the time. Yes, that's right. And that was dedicated for small and mid-sized customers. Great idea. Um, an inefficient start to the business. But what we learned is small and mid-sized companies don't have lots of users. So it might actually be better 
to focus on larger companies with buying centers so you can scale. Yep. But that's the SaaS part of the model. Okay. Then there's the virtualization, the working with partners, and creating cloud-based solutions for customers. And clouds do free up more dollars to spend elsewhere, right? Right. I mean, I walked into a CEO the other day in New York City. First thing a guy said to me, Bill, do me a favor. Put me in a private cloud environment, virtualize it, and get half the hardware costs out of my enterprise so I can buy some of your software. I mean, they know what's going on. Okay. So we, we had that conversation around the cloud. We also had the conversation around software as a service. We knew that things like talent management, things like CRM were obviously going to the cloud. Procurement was going to the cloud. And we really didn't have any other assets except business by design. And, and, and you'd struggle. Let's face it. Business by design was a long and painful struggle for SAP. If I take off the shirt, I've got you, some you got of the, the stretch marks. marks. <laughs> yeah. No doubt. Yeah, yeah. And then we also... But you learned from it. Of course you yeah, learn yeah, from it. Yeah. And it makes you... You know, makes yeah. you better. Yeah. Your mother told you that too, right? She did. It she did tell kill you. I, I, you know? <laughs> it doesn't kill you. It makes you better. Broccoli then, was on the on, on the cusp for me. Exactly. But go ahead. Exactly. And then we knew, you know, we had to go after database and technology, but that was because we knew Hana was going to be the innovation of maybe the last 30 years. When did Hana hit your radar? Hana hit our radar like right around the 2010 mark we knew that what we saw in the lab was extraordinarily encouraging and most people here will know what hana is but not everyone so just high performance application network appliance the idea is to take data it's actually the southern city of maui i'm sorry that too <laughs> even better but <laughs> there, there's so many theories as to where that name <laughs> yeah, comes we from. Won't, we won't go. But okay. The idea was basically to create an environment for customers where they could Google their own data. You move it into main memory yeah. instead of storing it on disk or tape, yeah. and you create a much faster decision-making cycle, give information to the people that need it so they can make better calls. And it happens to be 100,000 times faster than any other technology in the world. But, and, but who's bragging? But who's bragging? No, no, we wouldn't brag. Um, so you got... You got HANA. Faster than Exabyte? Oh, I'm sorry. Keep going. Exadata? I mean, keep going. Whatever. Uh, we, we, we're, <laughs> keep going. we move beyond disk. <laughs> okay. Keep going. Um, keep going. So we've got the cloud now. We've got the mobile vision. And we've got database technology in HANA. Okay. Which led to some of the early moves in the strategy. So in HANA, you were able to innovate internally. Correct. Elsewhere, at your size, one of the challenges companies have at your size is for anything to be material, organically takes a long time. Yes. So like even HANA, so HANA is organic, right? There is no significant acquisition at the core of your HANA initiative? Pure, pure, pure organic. organic. In tw without, I don't know, do you guys report out HANA separately yet? Yes, we do. Okay, so wh where do you think HANA is, just how far has it come in the time it's been in terms of like revenue or growth or whatever is the reason? Well, in, uh, in less than a year, um, HANA will be a near half a billion U.S. dollar market. Wow, that's, that's awfully, that's pretty awfully big. fast. Pretty big. Um, in, in some segments? Or, I mean, has, has it been like just a couple of segments where that's happened? Or where, where's, what's, what, what, are, what are the use cases that are driving the early adoption? Multi-industry. So okay. in the banking industry, one of the real pain points for a large bank is cash management. Yeah. You know, they close, the day, they close the bank at 5, between 5 and 8, they're getting their cash position organized, and then they're going to make some investments uh, in the morning. HANA, instead of having staffs of people with reports do that, HANA does it in a matter of a couple of minutes. And you don't need people, HANA does it. Um, if you're a telecommunications company and you're in a very thin margin industry and you're competing for every consumer and 1% of churn could mean 50% of profits, it's pretty important to personalize the offer dynamically and dynamically price an offer yep. to a consumer. Yep. If Good you are in the healthcare industry and you're studying the genome of various cells and what they're likely to do or not do, Harm, uh, HANA can cut through that data in seconds, if not minutes, when the process normally takes Got weeks. It. Got it. Okay. Um, it's, right. it's just amazing. Okay. But I, I do think you mentioned M&A. Yeah. I mean, in the first 100 days where we were co-CEOs, we bought Sybase. That's so, kind of, in 100 days? Yeah. We actually made the move 
to. Um, you go to the board and say, "This is kind of like our coming out party. You got to, you got to at least give us one well, present to sort of." Well, <laughs> that's a good point. Well, well, at some point, you just got to say, you know, here's the badge moment. How long had you been looking at? at yes, ex no, that's exactly right. You put your badge on the table and say, this "Hey, is this it. is it." So, so how long had you guys been looking at Sybase before you made that call? In the strategy that we put together in the first two weeks. We had Sybase on the radar screen because of the mobility, mobility thing. Because Sybase had done a mobile app with you guys on an iPhone the year before. That I think, I think it was like 60 days into being co-CEO. The iPad, believe it or not, was actually new then. You know, we all think it's been here since birth. <laughs> and we had a partnership going with Sybase where we moved the CRM application onto the iPad. Now, our user experience hasn't always been gorgeous. As perfect. The SAP user experience, OK, perfume but, from the Soviet Union and user experiences <laughs> from SAP. OK, I, I'm thinking, that, OK, OK, OK. But okay, that okay, in okay. there lies okay. the idea for change, right? Yeah, exactly. So now you move this CRM application to the iPad, and it's gorgeous. So two things happen. One, we put an order in for 4,000 iPads. Jobs calls me up and says, what are you doing? Is this a joke? No, it's not a joke. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, I'm being yeah. Steve. Yeah, yeah. 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 Wait, is this like your, your yeah. award thing? Yeah. And he's like, <laughs> it's like, what are you doing? And I said, well, we're doing these applications onto the iPad, beautiful user experience. It's gorgeous. He said, but it doesn't print. And he goes through a whole checklist of things it doesn't do. I said, we don't care. And he said, this is the moment that I know this is going to be a massive corporate success. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. you said you don't care. And then the next thing we did, it was the same night. We made a call to John Chen and said, John, have you seen this? And it looks so gorgeous. And John, once in a while, you got to move from dating to serious <laughs> relationship, and we need to get married. Count to 10, 1,000. John got his breath back, and we agreed to do a deal in 16 days. That's amazing. That's fair. OK, so that's, that, that was your, that was your uh, mobility acquisition. Very interesting resources there. In the cloud world, you talked about SaaS. We, I said it was a long journey. So you said, OK, I'm going to go to outside the company for that, too. Right. Well, 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 a couple of ones that you, that you mentioned. Go ahead. Just so, finish off the start. Um, the, so once we did Sybase, we, we got the mobile play and we could scale it, but we also got database and 1,500 engineers that came with Sybase. And that's an interesting story in and of itself. But I'll, let me go to the okay. cloud yeah, where yeah, you yeah, took yeah, me. Yeah, 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 we, um, we acquired success factors. Why did we go for success factors? They had the cloud DNA, a leader that fit beautifully into our culture where we can give them the cloud and let them run it. And we really, really believe strongly in talent management and the fact that it was going to move to the cloud anyway. Then we made a move for Ariba. And we see the real-time business network. You know, it's Cynthia and I have dinner tonight. I probably would love to have known when you bro you're born and what you had for lunch and all that. But I would love it even more if I could connect your buyers and your sellers on a global framework, and we could bring in um, all kinds of business people that want to trade okay. on a live platform. Okay. And you put Hana on that. Now you've got a real-time trading network for the businesses all over the world in every industry. So that's kind of where we were going with the cloud. So now I want to go back to your first statement, which is you said, look, at the end of the day, it's the main thing. You've got to stay focused on the main thing. We've got these additional market forces. If you look ahead to the next five years, what do you think the world wants? What role do you think the world wants SAP to play? Well, I think the world, based upon our vision, and I stand by it, is the world wants us to make it run better. I think, I th actually, what does that mean to you? What it means to me is we asked ourselves in 2010, why do we matter? And if we weren't here, what difference would it make? And we came to the quick conclusion that there are entire industries that run their companies on SAP. For sure. So they depend on us. So we matter. And now they depend on us more than ever to innovate because either they have to get leaner and more efficient and optimize the value chain because times are tough, whether it's southern Europe or elsewhere, or they need to grow. I walk into boardrooms, and when I go in those boardrooms, those CEOs look in my eye, and they're like, I need you to help me grow this business. Here's my deal with the board. Here's my strategic imperatives. How can you help me get to my consumers? How can you help me do it faster? How can you make me a really well-run machine? So, so what's interesting to me is when I first met SAP in the early 90s, 
It was much more about operational excellence. It was a global ERP system. It's going to be the first integrated system we ever had. It's going to run the same in Japan as it does in yes. Germany, as the same as in the U.S. You're talking much more, and it was a very internally focused world. I mean, the, you learned to use SAP. You did it the SAP way, or right. you did it the SAP way. And there was some customization in there as to whether it was an S or an S in front of the SAP. So there was not much choice. But now you're talking about a different world. So how is, as, you, as the world wants to run better in this decade, what do you have to do differently in this decade than you had to do in the 90s where, I think in the 90s you were helping us find a global standard mm -hmm. platform. Right. I don't think that's what you're doing in this decade. You're absolutely right. I think the big revolution is the consumer revolution. I mean, if you look at the global economy right now, there'll be three billion purchasing class people added to the selling opportunities for companies all over the world. Many of them will be in Asia. Most of them will be obviously on the device. And the big change is they've got the power. So the power moved away from centralization to decentralization. It moved from the corner office to the user and the experience that you provide to the user. And it moved from B2B to B2B to C. And if you can't help the company get to their nth consumer, you can't help the company. So what we said is we want to make the world run better and improve people's lives. And by improving people's lives, we mean we want to reach a billion users of our software by 2015. And we want to make all of those users more productive. So is a consumer a user of your software in the new model? Absolutely. OK, because in the old model, one of the problems with the old model is you actually had very few users. Mm -hmm. You had many, many customers, right. but, but few users. But now you, so, so that, that's, a, that's a different model. OK, let me, let me move this slightly differently. So you talked about the 3 billion new users. You, made, you rose to power, as did virtually all the companies in this valley in a developed economy selling systems to other people in mm -hmm. other developed mm -hmm. economy countries, uh, your own country and then, and then other countries. We were talking on the phone the other day about growth in the world. And you mentioned that like seven of the top ten. 10 fastest growing countries are in Africa. You've never been in Africa. Most of the Silicon Valley companies, I mean, never been. But I mean, we, no presence in Africa. What are you, how are you going to do that? How are you going to take your company and your company's culture and cost envelope and all that stuff mm -hmm. into these new markets. Well, what's kind of interesting is we're, you know, very heavily invested in being a truly global software company already. So you take your strong position in South Africa and you expand that to Kenya and other parts of Africa where you can really create some value. That's important to do. We did this in China too. We said, hey, you can't get to China unless you're going to invest. We didn't go for a JV. We went in it alone with a great ecosystem. So we'll invest $2 billion in China by 2015. But we can't possibly hire all the necessary people to keep up with that demand. The demand far outstrips the supply. So we work with our partners. So who are your partners in China? We have countless partners in China. But the ones that you would recognize here in the United States are also our partners there. Okay. And then you create local ones. For example. We'll hire 6,000 people this year out of university. Some of them will work for SAP. Some of them will work for our partners. Some of them okay, will work for so our customers. So an Accenture or, or a, or a Ex Accenture will put 10,000 people in China in an innovation center with SAP between now and 2015. Okay. So that kind of reach, that kind of bandwidth is just unbelievable if you can create an ecosystem that our ecosystem right now is probably 10 times the size of our company. Well, it's interesting. It's when you guys, again, when you came on the scene in the 90s, you looked very much like a closed system. It was all done in ABAP. Mm -hmm. It was all done with a German accent. And, 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 no, but seriously, it, it, I mean, and, and Accenture made a fortune configuring your system. Right. But other than that, there wasn't much of an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Listen, fast forward to this decade. Talk about, the, talk about the texture of your ecosystem. Is it just systems integrators still? What, what's going on? Well, first of all, um, it's certainly not just systems integrators. It's all the high-tech companies that you would recognize in this valley in some way, shape, or form are touching SAP in some kind of partnership, even our enemies. So you know, we're pretty honest and open about that. So think of any company, you name it, they're partnering. Also, the VC firms or the early stage companies. We warmly welcome them now to SAP. We'll invest in them, 
Sometimes we'll put money up and take a position in the company, but we'll obviously give them our technology and let them innovate on top of our technology to expand our reach. Mm -hmm. So we're a very, very open company, and that is a fundamental belief. I would give any competitor in the world SAP HANA. First of all, they'll need it to survive. <laughs> but there's no reason not to give it to them because we know HANA needs to be the standard for the world because it's going to help the world run better. So are you going to open source some part of this? It's not a matter of open sourcing okay. it necessarily, but okay. it's like we have a, a very large uh, software company that came to us and said, if I could put my company platform on HANA, would you do a deal with us? Would you allow such a thing? Yeah. To which we replied, of, of course we would. Because um, HANA is going to be the standard. You should have that, and you should run better. Okay, so like SQL. Okay, I'm going to ask a couple more questions, but, but fairly quickly, I think you guys should be thinking about questions you'd like to ask Bill as you're thinking about, about things, but I've got a couple, a couple more about them. A couple more uh, questions to ask. Actually, one key one. So, first of all, how many people are in SAP right now, roughly? 61,000. 61,000 people. Um, you probably know them all by name, actually, knowing you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but if I but don't, I go to Hana. You, 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 you check it out. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Um, so, I have to say that I, I, I knew your predecessor, I knew his predecessor, and I knew his predecessor. Yes. So, I've kind of known the company for about 10 years. And I would say that change management was the heaviest burden that all three of your pre uh, predecessors carried around. And the feeling that I don't know that I can get this company to change. Mm -hmm. Not because it's a bad company, but because it was just very deeply anchored in its, in its heritage. Uh, I don't sense that from you at all. And I'm kind of curious as to what, what's going on. What, what has happened either in you and Jim or in the company or in the world that has given you this sense that and in fact, your results are, are showing that you're changing. It's not just that you think you can change. You're, you've had very successful uh, financial results recently. So, so w what's going on? Well, we realize that you know, none of us is as smart as all of us. If you've got 61,000 people, and they must have done something in their life to get to SAP in the first place, use them. Get them in the game. And respect them as individuals. Respect teams of people. Have managers that make the news, not managers that report the news. I despise bureaucracy. And managers that use their people as summary communication tools so they look good to their boss, these are the kinds of people that you've got to get out of the company. People in management should be on the front lines with the people doing the good work for the customer and helping them to be successful. With technology, like HANA, everybody has the same set of facts. So we don't have to play office anymore. We don't have to play reports anymore. It's all in HANA. It's all in real time. It's all on your iPad. So go make some news. So the first thing we did is we said, we will drink our own champagne. We will run our company on our own technology. And we will get in front of the customer. And we have no interest in reporters. If we want a reporter, we'll call somebody in the media. So go out there and do something. And, <laughs> all right? Okay, and, okay, okay. And then, even in the boardroom, even in the boardroom, hey, you know, boards today, a lot of them, and I've been in them, they come to the meeting, you know, they get the book, FedEx to their house on Saturday, they think about the board meeting for a few moments, write down a few clever questions, derail the conversation into an unanswerable <laughs> situation. It's called so, added value. So, you know, what, what you do is just, just call a timeout and just say, oh, hang on, hang on. It's a good question, very good question. Um, Hana can handle that. Let's get the question answered by Hana, and then we'll go back to the strategy discussion, okay? So, technology can really change the game. You've got to empower the people, you've got to give the people the tools, and you've got to have a, a, a culture that's focused on the right things. So, you have, but, but I would say at the core of the culture it was a, it was a bureaucracy, right? There, there was a bureaucracy. So talk a little bit about kind of some of the tools a, a leader can use to begin to, 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 I mean, I get the idea that I'm supposed to empower my people, and I'm actually, I'm at the how level now of 
do you modify compensation systems? Do you modify management systems? Do you change, is it just swapping out, getting the right people in place? I mean, what, 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 what's going on? Well, first of all, again, I, I keep going back to the strategy. Yep. Because if you don't have a good strategy, the people will always do the good work. People are 99% of the time truly good and they have the best intentions. But if you give them a bad strategy, they're going to just dig all night and the ditch is just going to get deeper. So we had to basically keep the main thing the main thing and focus on where the world was going, not where the world was. The other thing we had to do is get a bias for innovation. If you don't innovate, just go home. There's no point. It's just not worth it. Do Oprah reruns and you know, relax. Because it's little not, golf. I, I, little I, golf little is golf. fine little too, golf. but it is not going to come together yep. unless you innovate. And some of that innovation for a large company has to be M&A. And we made our bets and we made big bets. We didn't screw around. And I actually think that boldness created a, hey, wait a minute, something's moving here. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I've learned about changing cultures is you've got to nail it in the first 60 to 90 to 100 days. You can't, like, get the commission and the committees to build another committee, to go through the transformation committee, to report to the committee on how the change is going. It's like, look, the uh, seat of your pants need to be on fire because this is what's at stake. And everybody just starts moving in a solid direction around a strategy. So that's kind of the way I saw it cool. early on. Cool. So, uh, so questions from the group. I think I've, I've been having some fun here, but I'd love to have other people uh, kind of have a, this question over here. Okay. Hi, uh, Jeff Claben. I teach at Santa Clara University. Hey. I'm just curious uh, what key skills or subjects you'd like to see students coming out of college with these days. Thank you very much, Jeff, for the question. STEM. It's a STEM world, man. Science, technology, engineering, and math. And if you look at all the things that you know, we need more of, we need the skill sets in those areas to really put uh, a turbocharge on our company. And I would also say designers. The idea of designers and designing things that are beautiful. I mean, if you look, again, it's easy to go to Apple in this one, but they have beautiful design. Things look beautiful. And probably others have technology that could be on par, but you design something beautiful and it's easy to use and the experience is dynamite. you got a winner. So designers in a, in a technology sense would be very Let me helpful. piggyback on that question. So you, uh, of the 61,000 people in SAP, how many are in the sales force? Uh, 10,000. 10,000. So in the, if I'm in the sales force, I may not have a STEM background necessarily. Right. I may not be a designer. What is it about me that would make me really powerful and successful in your sales force? Customer centricity. What we learned a long time ago, and we just keep refining this. First of all, you have to have a, a DNA for the customer. And it has to be authentic because customers see through it a mile away when it isn't. But customers today, they're under a lot of pressure. They have to deliver results. So we're into business outcome driven technology. What I like to try to do is con um, configure solutions that are tailored very specifically to industry pain points that not only solve the pain point but also deliver the service and the implementation so the business outcome can be achieved. They used to say on time and on budget we talk about business outcome ahead of schedule now. Mm -hmm. So you really like getting into the customer's world and solving their problem in a powerful way. The other thing, Jeffrey, I would say, buy buying center. Because what we learned in the crisis is you cannot just sell to the enterprise contact. You've got to recognize that power has been distributed in these enterprises, and you've got to really rally all the buying centers to the table. Which is, which is not where we were. We were just selling to the IT guys. That was your uh, Michael Hammer example yeah. when you were re-engineering things. Yeah, yeah. Another, there was another question over here, I think. Or oh, John, 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 Mark, go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah hi. Brian Skiba. Um, Bill, you were mentioning about $500 million out of HANA. You've got to put a $2 billion a year number up just to get to the kind of double-digit growth where SAP is today. So the first part of the question is, you know, do you see acquisitions, you know, being about half of that sustainable growth going forward? And the second part is, given Larry and the guys at IBM and a bunch of other guys all shooting water buffalo while you guys are the elephants, do you worry about the idea that maybe you're going to clear the earth and there's not that many bigger things to take out at some point? Well, that's a really good question. Um, what we did with the M&A strategy is we got into categories. 
where we weren't strong enough, but that were growing really fast, to get enough critical mass where then we could build some organic innovation on top and scale. If you look at our numbers today, Jeffrey mentioned 25% growth year over year. In that number is only 2% in organic growth. After you've had an asset for over a year, it gets baked into the run rate. Only 2% in organic. So we are an organic growth company. You're absolutely right that there aren't a lot of, you know, obvious targets out there in the industry anymore, which is why I think that this idea of all M&A is unrealistic and it doesn't make a lot of sense. So we're primarily an organic growth company, I believe strongly, in the ecosystem and being a good partner and looking a person in the eye and committing to something and keeping your promise. Because if you can scale an ecosystem, which is a non-payroll workforce, and allow that non-payroll workforce to build the innovation into their business off the backbone of your IP, and it's a win-win for them and for you, that's an amazing force multiplier. So organic, M&A, ecosystem, and I'll give you one other thing. We got to get to the young people in this world. Even if you go to China, as much as China has done an amazing job with their economy, they have 10% of the college graduates that are completely unemployed, but half of them are underemployed and not happy with the job that they have. Most of them are making about 345 US dollars on a monthly basis. So how do we create an ecosystem network effect for these young ones to get them into opportunities where we can scale and expand and they can get higher paying jobs so you can lift all the boats and the tide rises in, in, in motion. That, that's the kind of thing we're on right Good now. Point. Next question over here. Yeah, um, Jean-Baptiste uh, with L'Expansion uh, magazine in France. Uh, Bill, you mentioned some of the growing point, pains uh, with by design. Um, so can you help us understand what's SAP's small business strategy? Uh, we, were talking, we were mentioning business one a few months ago by design. You mentioned that you were targeting now larger companies. Mm -hmm. So to reach that billion users in 2015, you know, what, what's right. your small business strategy? Sure, I'd be glad to. Well, first of all, on, uh, on by design, just to clear the air on that one, you know, we are looking at the um, satellite locations of the larger entities. We are looking at the upper mid market as the choice because you get more users and the product works beautifully, it's easy to use now, and it scales. But also we have something called Business One. Business One is one of the greatest products in the history of SAP, and Business One will be on HANA, so you will have a real-time business platform for small companies all over the world, and they can scale. And it goes in the international realm to places that the local competitors can go multi-currency, multi-language, and it scales to infinity and beyond, and you can put it in the cloud. So it's business one, and it's business by design, and it's all in one through some of our channel partners that build added IP and innovation by industry and the local markets on top. But the go-to-market for that, for that very small business is going to be through a, a channel partners? Channel. Yeah, because I think you, your core strength is dealing with large institutions and then, right. and then creating them. If I may, Jeffrey, yeah. we made in our vision we made it our priority to have 40% of our sales come through indirect channel partners by 2015. At that time, we were in the single digits. We're now up to 34% of our sales, sometimes 32 in a given quarter from the indirect channel. Okay, so that's a, that's a big move for you guys. Next question. <clears throat> yeah, hi, I'm one of those media reporters you referenced earlier. I'm listening to you very carefully, Bill. Uh, this is Chris Primesberger from eWeek. And JB, you just asked my question, so I have to come up with a new question. <laughs> um, Bill, um, you talk about strategy. Could you kind of outline your strategy in the market competing against companies like Oracle and some others? Because they're obviously a direct competitor to you in many ways, and they don't have the in-memory database that you have. Is that going to be the number one weapon against a company like that? Well, first of all, you know, our relationship with Oracle is, is a complex one. And the most important thing in the relationship... How, well, how many of your systems run on Oracle databases? Th there's quite a few. Yeah. Um, yeah. They are... They yeah. are... Yeah. They, yeah. And, you know, give them credit for that. Yeah, you bet. And, um, by the way, you know, if it's good for the customer, then that's what we mm -hmm. do. And no matter, you know, what the company is. Um, 
but I, I want to, you know, be fair to them and respectful. They did a good job in their core, and we now have a fighting brand with Sybase and the traditional disk base uh, database, and we think HANA, the in-memory nature of HANA, will be the game changer. We have to prove that, but we, that's what we believe. I really don't think it's in SAP's interest to spend a lot of time obsessing on what they're doing and what others are doing. Because right now, we've got the momentum. And our strategy is on course. And I think the moves that I see others making right now seem to be a step or two behind the one that we're doing. And I think our idea now is to just innovate and out-innovate anybody that we possibly can, and then be friendly to all of our good partners, but focus on the customer. So I don't do that locker room talk anymore, just because I think we're in a new place. I really believe we, as a company, are in a whole new place. And as I said earlier, in all respect to um, Oracle and any one of our competitors, we warmly would welcome them using HANA and our mobile solutions and, and all that as well. Sure. Okay, next question. Hi, Bill. Uh, Kyle Columbus with Mercedes-Benz um, Research and Development. I was wondering, how do you see um, the progression and the potential of HANA to connect customers that are deeply rooted in SAP to other customers that are also deeply rooted in real-time, actionable um, connections and actual um, revenue streams? I think it's uh, certainly the way we want to go. I give you one example. Put a Reba on HANA. You're connecting business to business and a business network globally on a real-time trading platform called SAP HANA. The magic of HANA is also, and I met with the telecommunications executive today, Jonathan Becker, who runs marketing, is you know, very well aware of this, where they want to have real-time interaction points not only on a business-to-business -business level, but on a business-to-business -to, -business to every consumer level. So every one of their potential customers, they know how much time they spend on these phones 12 hours a day is a long time, and they want to personalize offer and, uh, offers and do dynamic pricing based upon the response to those offers. Uh, another example, I was uh, recently in an airport where I had to get a flight out and would have done anything, you know, like crawled across the airport on my hands and knees to get a seat. Which but, is the normal protocol the airlines course, require course, at this time. Of course, yes, yes. And, and what was amazing <laughs> is, you know, they told me that there was likely to be one seat because there was all these sad stories and everybody was coming in on this plane. And I, I saw someone else get the seat in front of me and I'm like, there goes four hours, what can you do? And I thought to myself, wow, it's too bad this airline isn't like the airline that has SAP HANA and that can do dynamic pricing based upon seat availability. Because I would have paid anything to get that $22,000. So just think about the new models. Think about the new models. This guy probably got it on some cheap upgrade certificate. I would have paid anything. So yeah, okay. that's, the, that's, that's the way we see it. Connecting that's, people, that's connecting good. processes, <laughs> connecting offers. Right, Sanjay? Yeah, that's good. Sanjay Poonan runs our mobile. This guy is unbelievable. Absolutely. Next question. How are we doing for time, by the way? Yeah, Satish Subramanian okay, okay. from Intoto Surgical. I'm sorry, so, say it one more time. Uh, Satish Subramanian from Intoto Surgical. So uh, my question is more on the cloud and uh, related to medium and large companies that have got large, uh, you know, on-premise ERP installations. So where do you see those companies doing? I mean, are they looking at cloud just for, from an ERP perspective? And uh, what, what trends are you seeing and what, what do you expect over the next few years? What we see at SAP between the cloud, the device, and the on-premise world is a hybrid scenario. There's just companies that have invested a lot in these infrastructures. They want to innovate at the edge of the enterprise. And when they do that, it's always nice if they can do that in the cloud because it's faster, they might be able to do it at a lower price point, and that's fine. Um, they obviously all want to move everything that they possibly can in terms of innovation to the device. And then the one example I gave you earlier about the CEO of the bank, if they can virtualize some of the infrastructure and take cost out in the form of more efficient hardware and so on, they'll do it. Our brand promise is whether it's on-premise, on-demand, or in the cloud, or on-device, we'll orchestrate at the uh, application, at the security, and at the data level with excellence, and that's what we do. 
So I have a follow-up question on that, which is, you know, we're seeing the world go more toward apps, and what, we used to have portals, and portals to an ERP system or a client-server system looked a lot like a well-behaved mm -hmm. client. Apps are, seem like they're getting a little bit more ambitious. Are you going to have to re-architect the core ERP engine in some new way to make it more accessible that the app in app uh, edge or or what's going on there? Well, as an example, um, maybe this is the the big moment to tell you this. The um, if you take um, real time CRM, that would be an example of taking these discrete applications and putting them on SAP HANA to remarkably simplify the environment and the speed of execution for enterprises. We can see a world where you can go all the way. Uh, so the answer to that question is... I don't is, know what, quite what all the way means. Well, I'm what it feeling means a little is bit like in high school. SAP, <laughs> SAP, HANA, <laughs> SAP HANA has the capability to completely simplify and redesign and re-engineer the data center of the future. Say some more words. So the ERP system w powered by SAP HANA. Yeah. That is the engine you're looking for, and SAP will deliver that to the world. Uh, still, I'm still so okay. So I've got, I've got, I've got. I'm imagining this very, very large real-time memory system that's running the whole shebang, yeah. right? Okay. So I have. So what? It, uh, so obviously, it's 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 much faster in mm -hmm. responding. Is that just it? It's just it's just faster. It's the same system as well, I had before. It's not only the structured information in the enterprise. It's also the unstructured in yep. information in the enterprise. So the things that are going on in social networks are probably pretty important for you to know about. I'll give you an example, customer sentiment analysis. Sure. You know, how do my customers feel about me? What do they say in the social network? Social networks today have uh, much more than a billion users on them. More than 35% of the information in the social networks is about brands, so it's real yeah, important yeah, to yeah, get yeah, that sentiment. feedback. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that sentiment analysis is one example where you get non-structured data as well as structured data. Now, you may say, well, I want to prioritize my data in the enterprise. Some of it could be cold, some of it could be hot. I want to do it in the most efficient way possible. I don't mean that other technologies aren't going to be around. I got it. But the most important, high-powered, rich, data-based technologies that give real-time capability to decision makers can be done on yeah, SAP yeah, HANA. Yeah, and yeah. that, to us, is the game changer. Now, that doesn't yeah. mean we're not going to innovate the applications for di different industries sure. and so on. Sure but it will be done on HANA, and that's what gives it cool. all the okay. change. Next question. Oops, so, oh, I got to hear this. Hi, Bill. Ray Wong with uh, Constellation, Constellation Research. Uh, question for you is, as we move to consumerization of IT, the trend is happening very quickly, and something that Jeffrey Moore and I share a passion for, the shift from transactions to engagement, uh, who do you see as your future competitors? Are, is Amazon, Facebook, Google, are they competitors? Are they cooperators? Are they people you want to partner with? Will they be in your space? In five years? I think uh, all the companies you just mentioned, Amazon, for example, there's lots of SAP uh, installations in Amazon's cloud, and they're all over the world, well, thousands of them. So in that context, I, I certainly think of Amazon as a partner. I absolutely would like to have Facebook and Google as a partner. And there are going to be scenarios, Ray, where all these companies at some point will compete with something in our business model. But Okay. And that's the world we live in. Some of the biggest partners and the best partners we have today compete with us rigorously in certain areas. I think one of the things you have to do is change your attitude around these partnerships and be much more accepting of other people's business models and just find a way where you can make things work as opposed to taking these military stands and we will crush you and that is the hill and you shall not cross it. I mean, it's a, it's a competitive world, and there's a lot of players out there, and we'd like to partner with Facebook and Google, and we look forward to that. Uh, <clears throat> Tony Reese, uh, Business Planning Associates. Um, have you seen uh, the social media you were talking about as kind of an external force? Have you seen that migrating internally into the way companies kind of expect to share information or change their business processes? Absolutely. Um, in our company, as an example, when we acquired SuccessFactors, they have a, a social networking tool called Jam. And we're actually putting our whole company on Jam. And what we learned is, you know, while email is certainly an important technology and we all use it and all that, teams of people 
like to work on jam sessions where they're communicating instantaneously with each other, just like a social networking, without the heaviness of some of the more formal applications. Um, we see this in our company, and we see this in a lot of other companies we talk to, and some of our great partners like Microsoft and others have made some very important acquisitions in that category to complement their core. Yep. And, you know, it's the, way it, it's the way it's going, and you can see why. You know, you see the tsunami or you know, Arab Spring, and you see how people rise up in social networks and communities, and I met with one CEO, we had the CEO event, and he's putting his whole company on social, and there won't be anything else, and he's got a huge global company. So it's, it's, it's real, it's here, and it's the wave of the future. So, so I, you just, that triggered a thought for me, which is, you've been talking about, we are talking about competitors there for a minute, and I think you have a pretty uh, interesting attitude about uh, competition. Let's talk a little bit about what you, lessons learned from great competitors. So you've got some pretty interesting companies I in your world, and we've talked a little bit about Oracle. Uh, Salesforce is an interesting company. What if, if you could take one lesson away from, from Salesforce and, and, and what Mark Benefioff is doing, what do you think, what do you think is the lesson there? User experience. And I think the uh, one change that we need um, to make clear to the world, especially in Silicon Valley, is we understand and we have made the remedies to, uh, to really get inside of that through mobile. But also we're going for something we call user force, which is not only will we make beautiful applications, not only will we put it on mobile devices and let you experience it the way, way you want, but we'll actually even provide a service where if you want something customized to just the way you want it, because you're an individual, mm -hmm. and you may want it with ketchup and mayo, but no, you know, no lettuce, we'll give it to you your way. Mm -hmm. And that bias for the user, designing things that are pleasing to the user, bending over backwards, not just to make companies happy, but the users in those companies, is something I think we've learned. And I'm sure that uh, Mark and his company had something to do with that, and all credit to him. Yeah, I think so. One other one, I'll open up for questions again. What if, if you had to take one lesson away from IBM and what IBM has kind of done to itself in kind of in the era that you've been in business, what would you take away from that? Well, I think IBM really does keep the main thing the main thing, and then they innovate around the main thing. So if is you, their main thing the same as yours, or is it different? It's different. I mean, they they have a much larger. We're a little company compared to the, their overall size, but what we have in a sense that might be main thing in terms of comparison software. They have a very big software yeah, business, yeah, yeah. and uh, certainly we have a very big software business, but it's a different type of software yeah, business. Yeah. Um, so I think they've kept their main culture dating back to Watson and the mm -hmm. values of mm -hmm. the company for over 100 years, and you've got to give them a lot of credit mm -hmm. for that. And they changed when they had to. They knew they had to get services to deal with an evolving world when they did PwC, and they knew they had to get software in there to enrich the margin profile, and they did that ahead of other companies that now wish they had thought of that in their strategy. Um, and, and finally, I think they really understand an ecosystem approach, and they know how to leverage the ecosystem. And they're very good at account management and account ownership, and you give them a lot of credit for that. So yeah, yeah. all those things are very okay. positive. Cool. Okay. Next question. Hi, uh, Vanessa Linlaw with Edelman. Um, curious to know what unique aspects of SAP's culture drive innovation. Well, unique aspects of the culture drive innovation. I, I really have to give Hassel Plattner the, so much credit because, you know, he's a guy that invented the company in, along with the founders. But at 68 years old, has the passion of an 18-year-old for innovation. And he is truly, you know, a Hall of Fame legend in technology. So I really give him the credit for being that inspiration, that ego of innovation in the company's culture. And he deserves And that. how does he interact? So first of all, where does, ha what's, where does he live? I mean, I see his house on Cordoval. I mean, but, but he's never there. Guys like Hasso have lots of houses. They do have lots of houses. <laughs> I mean, does, um, he have, does he ever stay in any one of them? <laughs> why stay in any one place yeah, right, for too keep, long keep, if you keep don't moving, have to? Keep moving. Um, but, no, my real question was, how does he interact with the company? And does the company get to experience Hasso directly or only indirectly through his persona? Well, Hasso is the chairman of the supervisory board, yep. which would be like the chairman of the board here in the US. Um, he is also the technology advisor to the whole company. 
and in particular, his true passion right now is Hana. Yeah. But what's great about Hasso is when he has a passion for something, it's because he has the vision to see all the way over the trees and know what's on the other side. But he also has the will, the will to make it through. Yeah, and make which it is happen. huge, which is huge. Which is huge. Yeah, and yeah, the other yeah. thing I love about his personality is he does not get distracted. Once he locks onto that bone, <laughs> if it's Hana, that's it, you know? And he gets the job done in that regard. So great visionary, great legend, and a great person. Cool, cool. Over here, yes. Hi, uh, Tom Rodden, Varian Medical Systems. My question's around usability. Uh, and, and Jeffrey spoke at the beginning of this evening about anchors and how important anchors are. Um, they can also be a, a drag, right? Um, and I'm interested in usability specifically around ECC, ERP. Um, what we've experienced over the last couple of years with Invariant has been a battle royale between IT and the rest of the business when it comes to extending the footprint. We believe it's the right thing to do to go into PLM. We believe it's the right thing to do to expand CRM. It's the right thing to do in terms of the, the seamless experience across the enterprise with MES, with ME and MII on the shop floor. But in every case, the battle has been around looking at ERP and those users, the engineers for PLM, uh, the shop floor guys in manufacturing around MEI, ME and MII, um, the HR people in our organization who, before you bought Success Factors selected Success Factors over SAP Thank HR, you. and in every case it was I look back at ERP, and that's not what I want, and so it's been a difficult journey for us, and I'm looking for SAP to make a a, a real dramatic bold statement around ERP and that core that you spoke of, and and what's going to be done there as opposed to looking at all the other uh, portions of the of the system. Yeah, that's very fair. Uh, we call that continuous innovation without disruption. So one thing we want to obviously do with the core platform is continuously enhance it through enhancement packages where we can keep bringing you the innovation and keep that user experience ever increasing in terms of satisfaction, especially for the users, especially for how easy it is and how beautiful it is to use. One idea I would have for you, I was at um, Gulfstream and you know, they make some beautiful airplanes. And what they did in their company with SAP in, uh, is this right hemisphere solution where they have everything in 3D. And this doesn't get enough play, even in our own company. Think about the CEO all the way down to the shop and right floor. hemisphere is a product, right? It's a product. It's a product. It's Think a 3D visualization product, 3D right? visualization yeah. product. Think about every person in the company, not just the engineers on the shop floor, but also the management team and the CEO using the same 3D technology, which means they have the data in a common format and they can see all of the problems and the opportunities in visual terms. And depending on the role they have in the company, they can di um, uh, click on and dig down as deep as they want to go and find the root cause and the answers and so on. So what I would basically say is we will continuously innovate without disrupting your investment. We have a true bias in the company on the R&D side for the user experience. And there are many new technologies like 3D technology that I think is something you should look at and maybe we can help you with. And then finally, also on the services side, this user force I think is something that could be brought to your firm and we could really focus on what it is you're trying to do and put it into user force and get it done for you. I absolutely want you to be a happy customer. So you're sitting next to Jonathan Becker, give me a card, I'll get involved. <laughs> so, 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 but Bill, but, but one of the things that does happen, I don't know if it's happened at Varian, but it certainly happens in a lot of places. When people implemented SAP the first time, or Oracle the first yes. time, it's not specific to any vendor, they often customized it and built, you know, put a lot of their own, and then they create a situation where they tie their own future up in, in modifications. I, is there anything you can do about that? Well, we were just having that conversation tonight at dinner with Cynthia and I. The thing is, you don't take something that's been finely tuned and engineered to perfection 
and mass customize it. It kind of defeats the whole purpose of it. So in some cases, we can revamp the install that you already have based on best business practice. And the practices have just gotten better with more and more users and more and more innovation and more and more experience. But what I tell companies all the time, and I just did one, you know, Crocs, the shoe company, they went SAP and I'm the executive sponsor and they make great shoes, by the way. I'll give them a little plug. They went public it. and all that. Yeah. Um, Those are not Crocs, no, so they're, they're not, not wearing them tonight. Um, they're not I, as formal as some of the other shoes. Yeah. Right. But what's amazing is they're so disciplined. They want to do the, um, the retail solution that's been perfected and tuned, and they want to do it out of the box, ready to run, engineered in the factory, and they want to do it in a certain time frame, and they want to do it globally. They want to do Big Bang, and they can with zero risk because they're following the template. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it, look, a couple more questions, and then I think we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, uh, call it quits. Well, let's say two more questions. So uh, one right here, please. Hi, I'm Hi. Aditi Daggett. I'm from Adobe Systems. I wanted to go back to the thing that you said all the way up front because I loved it. That you have to get inside the head of your customer who want to make payroll. And um, some of what we're trying to drive is about getting us back to getting in the head of the customer. You also talked about you're changing your workforce and getting more designers who can, who can deliver that beautiful experience. Our company is also about beautiful experience. So what I wanted to ask was, on top of HANA, delivering that beautiful experience, that visualization, that some of the things you're already yeah. hearing, what, are, what is your strategy? What does your uh, company think about what's in the head of the customer in terms of, for example, business intelligence? Is your direction that your customers should build their own experiences on top of HANA, or do you have a direction from your business intelligence suite that is going to work on that, you know, the beautiful thing? Uh, I think it's um, a little bit of both. First of all, I want to thank you, Adobe, for running HANA. Great HANA customer and, and a great company, I might add. And I know you're working with the marketing and the sales function and getting all that data into real time in HANA, which is fantastic. So it's a, it's a little bit of both. We want to build solutions in analytics or into the core platform that give you a beautiful user experience. But we also you know, recognize that you might want it a certain way, and we're open to giving it to you your way. Uh, so I think that as it relates to the user experience, the other aspect is mobile. So every interaction we have now, or every solution in Sanjay like this, we start with how's it going to look on a mobile device? And those screens should be gorgeous. And they should be even more gorgeous when you put it on a mobile device. So whether it's an analytics application, it's a procurement application, an HR application, they should all look gorgeous. They should all look like they're very uniform. But if you want something on top of that that's unique and just for you, we can do that too. And I think that's the headset shift that we've made as a company. All right, listen. it's it's. Uh, we've had, had Bill on stage for more than an hour. He's given us a lot of his time. Please join me and give me a minute. Thank hand. you. Thank you very much. Jeffrey. Thank you, man. Gentlemen, before you leave the stage, we have a small token of gratitude for you. I believe we have the freshly designed Churchill T-shirt coming for you. Does it go with the props? Hope you wear that in very good health. This, the video of this program will be available at youtube.com slash Churchill Club tomorrow or the next day, so pass that along for the people who weren't able to join us in the room this evening. Thanks again to SAP. You have been a wonderful audience. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you.